Today, we're introducing a murder case that happened in England, the missing Joanna Eads. A 25-year-old woman went missing around Christmas. A few days later, her body was found on a snowy roadside, not far from her house. The case was solved with the help of an anonymous informant. Born in April 1985, Joanna Yeats was from Hampshire, England. She went to Riddle College after high school. After she graduated, she continued her studies in landscape at University of Gloucestershire. She was very talented. At the age of 23, she began her career as a landscape architect in Winchester. She became friends with one of her colleagues, Greg Reardon, who was two years older than Joanna and shared lots of her interests. Shortly after they met, they fell in love. In 2009, the company where Joanna worked moved to Bristol, which is located in the southwest of England. Usually, some employees would refuse to relocate with the company and choose to leave. However, Joanna and Greg loved their jobs so much, and they didn't want to separate. Therefore, they decided to move to Bristol together and began their new life in the city. They rented a house and lived together. After a while, Joanna took a new job in another company for better career development. Joanna and Greg moved to Clifton in October 2010 for the sake of convenience. They rented an apartment in a posh area. They were very happy about their new home and were ecstatic about the future. They would never have expected that an accident would happen to Joanna after two months. The 17th of December, 2010, was a Friday. Joanna's boyfriend Greg planned to go back home to visit his parents and came back on Sunday night. Greg asked Joanna to go with him, but she rejected, saying she wasn't ready to see his parents yet. She was going to spend the weekend by herself. Greg left the apartment on Friday morning while Joanna went to the office as usual. When Joanna finished her work at 6 p.m., she was invited to the pub by her colleagues. Thinking she would be alone at home and there was nothing to do, she accepted the invitation. During the chat in the pub, Joanna revealed to her colleagues that her boyfriend had gone to his parents and she would be alone in the apartment this weekend. She looked a bit concerned, but nobody took it seriously. At 8 p.m., Joanna left the pub and went home. Joanna's apartment is located about 3 kilometers away from the pub. It takes about 30 minutes to walk home. Nobody ever saw her again after she left the pub, and no one knows what had happened to her. On the Sunday morning, 19th December, 2010, Greg realized that Jonah didn't reply to any of his messages, and the calls were not answered. He started to feel worried. At 8 p.m., Greg returned to the apartment. It was a cold, snowy evening. When Greg arrived, he noticed that the door was unlocked. He looked in every corner of the house and didn't find Joanna. Their cat hadn't been fed for days. Greg panicked. He didn't know where Joanna was. He took out his phone and called Joanna again. Just then, he heard phone ringing from the direction of the coke hanger. Greg found her phone in the coat pocket. He also found her wallet and keys in another pocket. It was freezing outside. Joanna didn't wear her coat and left her wallet and keys at home. Greg thought she might have popped out to the shop nearby and would be back soon. Greg waited till midnight, but she didn't come back. He called her parents and asked if she was with them. However, her parents said they hadn't seen her. They felt something was not right when they heard Greg couldn't get hold of her during the whole weekend and suggested calling the police. After that, they headed to the apartment immediately. The police also arrived at the apartment soon after they got the call. The police found some receipts when searching the house, one of which showed she bought a pizza and two bottles of cider. The police found the two drinks in the house. One of them had been opened and partially consumed. The other remained unopened. What was weird was that the police didn't find the pizza and there was no trace of cooking. They believed Joanna didn't eat the pizza. Everything in the apartment was intact. No valuable item was lost and there was no sign of struggle. The police deduced that Joanna went out after she returned to the apartment. It was unknown whether she went out alone or was taken out by somebody else. Later, the police had an interview with Joanna's colleagues who were the last people to see her. According to her colleagues, Joanna was not in a good mood that night. She said that it sucked that she had to be on her own at the weekend. She looked a bit concerned, but not scared when she said that. Then she left the pub alone. To help with their search, the police gathered the recordings from the shops along the way from the pub to her apartment. From the CCTV in the pub, they could see Joanna was drinking with her colleagues and left at around 8 o'clock, which was consistent with her colleagues' testimony. At 8.10, Joanna entered a supermarket. She didn't buy anything and left soon. At 8.24, she went into a shop and bought two bottles of apple cider. At 8.40, she went to a Tesco and bought a frozen pizza. The police found the receipt in her apartment. This was the last time Joanna was filmed by CCTV. Nobody saw her afterward. This suggested that she went missing before she reached home from Tesco or after she got home. Later, the police interviewed Joanna's neighbor, a young couple. The man was named Vincent Tabak. That night, Vincent was alone in his apartment. His girlfriend had gone to another city. He told the police that he didn't hear anything unusual from Joanna's room. Four days after Joanna went missing, her parents held a press conference and sought help from the public to find her. 
Two days later, they held another press conference. Joanna's father stated that, I think she was abducted after getting home to her flat. I have no idea of the circumstances of the abduction because of what was left behind. I feel sure she would not have gone out by herself, leaving all these things behind, and she was taken away somewhere. Joanna's father had this assumption because her keys, wallet, phone, and coat were all left at home. It snows a lot during December in Bristol, and the temperature is low. She wouldn't have gone out without a coat. Joanna's father told himself and the family to prepare for the worst. Greg and Joanna's friends set up a website to help look for her. On the 25th of December, a couple noticed something weird in the snow on the road near a golf course. When they were walking the dog, it was covered by snow, so the couple approached to have a closer look. They were startled to find that it was a human body. They heard about Joanna on the news before and decided to call the police at once. The police declared that the young female found in the snow was Joanna Yeats, who went missing eight days ago and showed signs of life. When she was found, she was fully dressed, but one sock was missing. There were some scratches on her body. They could not examine her body immediately because her body was frozen. On 28th, according to the autopsy, 43 wounds were found, including bruises and cuts, and it described her death to strangulation. She wasn't raped. There were no signs that she had consumed the pizza. The police couldn't tell the exact time when she was dead because her body was frozen by the snow. It was estimated that she died on the evening of 17th. The police concluded that it was a murder. A special investigation team was set up to look into this case. One of her socks was missing. They suspected that the murderer took it away. Later, the sock was found in the bin near her apartment. The police examined all the evidence they gathered and found a man's DNA in Jonah's trousers around the knee area. The first person the police investigated was Jonah's boyfriend, Greg. They checked Greg's phone and laptop and didn't find anything suspicious. He also had an alibi for the case. He was not in Bristol the night Joanna died. His claims seemed credible, so the police didn't list him as a suspect. A young woman told the police that she was at a party near Joanna's apartment the night Joanna went missing. At around 9 a.m., she heard someone screaming. This clue got the police's attention. At 8.40, Jonah was seen in a shop which wasn't far away from her apartment. It was about 20 minutes' walk to her home. She was probably murdered at 9 o'clock when the screaming was heard. There was another person who heard a woman cried for help, but she couldn't remember the exact date and time, which was understandable. Not everyone could remember what happened 10 days ago. However, the court would not take such vague testimony into consideration. The police believed Joanna was taken away after she got home because they didn't find the pizza in the apartment. There was no sign of struggle. The police reckoned Joanna must have known the person and opened the door willingly, or the person had the key to the door. Who would have a spare key to Jonah's apartment? The police turned the spotlight on Jonah's landlord, who was 65 years old and a retired English teacher. He was a university lecturer. After he retired, he rented some of his properties out. The police were told that the landlord had a temper and spent a lot of time indoors. The landlord knew Joanna and had a spare key to her door. She would have opened her door if she saw it was him. He lived in the same building with her. When Jonah's boyfriend left, they said goodbye at the door. Maybe the landlord heard their conversation and knew that Jonah would be alone that weekend. The police thought the landlord was a suspect. The media reported this murder and described the landlord as an odd man, naming him as chief suspect. Some even reported that he was the murderer even though he hadn't been arrested. Many journalists waited at the landlord's door. Wherever he went, he was followed. Every reporter wanted to get the first-hand news, and in doing so, he had no way to flee. While everyone was sure the landlord was guilty, Jonah's neighbor, Vincent Tabak, provided new testimony. According to him, the landlord didn't drag much. His car was parked in front of the building most of the time. On the day when Joanna went missing, he saw the landlord's car parking in a different direction, which meant the landlord drove him away on the night of 17th. On 30th December 2010, the police arrested the landlord on suspicion of murder under pressure from the public and searched his house when they got a search warrant. The landlord denied he was involved in the murder. In the end, the police didn't find any evidence in his house. According to the law, the police can only detain the suspect for as long as 24 hours, and they have to release the suspect if they don't have any evidence. But if the police are going to gain new evidence, they can prolong the custody for another 24 hours. The police searched not only the landlord's house, but also his car. However, no evidence showed he had killed Jonah. Two days later, the landlord was released, but the police didn't stop the investigation. But at last, they confirmed he was innocent. In January 2011, the BBC television program Crime Watch was filmed at the location of the murder. The filming of the reconstruction got huge media attention. More and more people got to know about the case. In 24 hours, the police received more than 300 clues and had a big breakthrough. The police discovered that the murderer may have moved her body using a big suitcase or bag. 
On the 20th of January, 2011, 32-year-old architectural engineer Vincent Tabak was arrested. This time, the media chose to be silent because they didn't want what happened to the landlord to happen again. According to the police, they got the clue from a young woman. The details were not announced. Vincent Vincent was born in the Netherlands in February 1978. In 2003, he got a master's degree in architectural design and planning. Later on, he got his PhD in philosophy. In 2007, he moved to the UK to work after he graduated. In June 2009, he moved into an apartment with his girlfriend. In October 2010, Jonna and her boyfriend moved in next door. Jonna didn't know Vincent and never met him. After Jonah went missing, Vincent went back to the Netherlands to celebrate Christmas. During his stay in the Netherlands, he had been keeping an eye on Jonah's case, and he called the police, telling them about the landlord driving out on the night Joanna was murdered. Oddly, he didn't mention anything about the landlord when he was asked by the police the first time until the landlord was arrested. Apparently, his behavior was suspicious. To get more information, on the 31st of December, 2010, the police flew to the Amsterdam to interview Vincent. During the interview, Vincent asked about the result of the autopsy, seemingly unintentionally, which made him more suspicious. The police arrested him immediately when he came back to the UK. The police found some pictures of a woman that looked like Jonah. The woman was in a pink shirt, which was similar to the top Jonah was wearing when she was murdered. The police also found that Vincent had searched questions online, like how long the decomposition of a corpse takes, and been collection days. The police ran a DNA test. The results showed that the DNA samples from Jonah's body matched Vincent. The DNA specialist said the probability of it not being a match with Vincent was less than one in a billion. Vincent denied that he was guilty. He altered his testimony. He claimed that he went to a shop that night. The police did see him on the CCTV. However, he didn't buy anything in the shop. It looked like he had intended to be filmed. Even though he was out that night, he still had enough time to kill Joanna when he came back, so he couldn't use that as an alibi. Vincent said to his lawyer that the DNA test was a setup. He was framed by the police just because they wanted to solve the case. He kept saying he had nothing to do with the murder. He even tried to kill himself in the prison. The police had to transfer him to another prison for his safety. To everyone's surprise, on the 5th of May 2011, Vincent admitted he murdered Joanna, but he said he killed her by accident. His plea of guilty was rejected. On the 4th of October 2011, the trial of Vincent started at the Crown Court at Bristol. Vincent pleaded guilty to manslaughter, but denied he murdered Joanna. He said he killed her by accident. The prosecutors believed it was premeditated. The prosecutors stated that 43 wounds were found on Joanna's body, including cuts and bruises. Joanna was 30 centimeters shorter than Vincent. Evidence showed that he entered Joanna's apartment that night. He used his height to overpower Joanna. The injuries showed she died after a long struggle. There was enough evidence to make the police believe it was an attempted murder. During the struggle, he grabbed her legs and left his DNA on the trousers. Vincent said that he met Joanna that night. She seemed flirty and invited him to have a drink in her apartment. Vincent attempted to kiss her, but she rejected and cried for help. Vincent was worried and wanted to calm her down. He grabbed her arms and put his hand around her neck. It lasted about 20 seconds. When he stopped, he realized she had stopped breathing. The trial lasted over 20 days. Vincent was found guilty of Jonah's murder by a majority verdict of 10 to 2 and was sentenced for life with a minimum term of 20 years. Meanwhile, the landlord sued eight newspapers for libel. He won the case and got a lot of compensation. A year after Joanna died, lots of people went to the church to pray for Joanna and give condolences to her family. Her graduate designs were published. When people are alone, they are more vulnerable. That's when misfortune happens. This is Horror Mysteries. Enjoy and subscribe to know more mysteries around the world.